The Golden Saxophone They stole my saxophone, Isaac yelled out. Couldn't believe it. He looked and looked for it, but it was gone. They had their gear in the back of a van and had gone for a bacon sandwich, leaving it unlocked. The thieves had been in a hurry, so they grabbed the closest things, and one of those was Isaac's sax. They were the Golden Void, a psychedelic band that were going to make it big soon. It was 1972. Wishbone Ash had just released Argus, Genesis, Foxtrot, and Jethro Tull, thick as a brick. Isaac saw himself as a rival to Ian Anderson, except he didn't stand on one leg when he played, wasn't famous, and played the saxophone rather than the flute. Maybe he was more like Hawkwind's Nick Turner, who did play the saxophone. But he wasn't going to be anything now, because his sax had been stolen, and he had no money to buy a replacement. Isaac was 18, and he'd just left school, and was picking up bits of work here and there, which suited him, because it gave him more time to focus on his music, but it didn't leave him with a lot of spare cash. The Void were doing free gigs now. They'd become more progressive as they'd gone along, and Isaac was right on with that. Prague was the future. They must have come in when I went back to the dressing room, Isaac said. I didn't see anybody, the Void's drummer Terry said. Sneaky bastards, Isaac muttered. What am I going to do now? I can maybe lend you some money, man, keyboard Jeff had said. My mum's had a premium bond win, and she said she'll share it. They had just been playing in a room in a pub on the commercial road, supporting a band who didn't pay the support, but felt they were doing the void a favour by letting them perform. I can't take your money, Jeff. Well, you know, mate, Jeff was a kind soul. Something will turn up, mate, Terry said. They dropped him off near home. Isaac got really low over the next couple of weeks. He had no sax, so he went to a couple of band rehearsals but felt totally useless. The Void had a gig in a pub in Lambeth, which he went to as part of the audience, and then one later at Elephant and Castle, which he didn't even bother going to. It was autumn. The clocks changed and the nights grew dark. Isaac got a job helping out the store's bloke at a firm just back of Oxford Street. He did a few extra hours for the cash, but once he'd paid for his board and lodge, he still didn't have enough to buy a sax. He found himself on Denmark Street, London's own Tin Pan Alley. There were offices of music publishers and musical agents in the buildings dotted along. Isaac had a milky coffee in the Gioconda Cafe. He saw Bill Wyman in there once, and David Bowie was also known to frequent the Gioconda when he was in town. The night was gathering. Because the clocks had fallen back an hour, there was the lovely dusk when the shop windows were lit, shining like golden caverns out into the dark street. Isaac finished his coffee, closed the door behind him with the ding of the cafe bell, and stepped out. It was cold. He pulled his coat tighter. There was even a fog starting. These were a rarity now since the Clean Air Acts. Once the deadly yellow fogs had killed thousands with their mixture of damp from the river and pollution from ten thousand factories, nitrogen and sulphur infiltrating the air like alchemist assassins. Isaac laughed. That would be a good title for a space rock song. He even began to work through possible saxophone riffs as he walked along in the thickening mist. Then he remembered he didn't have a saxophone. Time to go home. Cars edged past him in a long shuffling train, trying to nudge their way onto Charing Cross Road down Denmark Street ahead of him. A music shop he didn't recognise caught his eye. Classic musical instruments. He thought he knew all the music shops in London, but he hadn't seen this one. In the mist-wreathed gloom, the light shone out of its windows. He thought it looked a little antique in style, but there, in pride of place, was a gleaming golden saxophone. If his eyes didn't deceive him, it was an antique Boucher true tone in gold plate from the classic age of jazz. Wow, what would that be worth now? He went and pressed his nose almost up to the glass and felt the cold as he marvelled and coveted at the instrument they had on display. He stood there a long time thinking on how much he'd like the sax. 
and how little he could afford it. Then, when he'd had enough of breaking his heart, he almost turned to rejoin the London night, but before he stepped away, the shop door opened and a dark-haired man grinned out. Like what you see? Sure, Isaac said, just can't afford it. Come on in, take a look. Shouldn't you be shutting up by now? Hey, that's my problem, don't you worry about that. This guy must be desperate to make a sale. Maybe he was down on his daily take. But he didn't realise that he wasn't going to get a sale from Isaac. Listen, mate, I'm just wasting your time. It's my time to waste, the man said. Just come on in. Isaac sighed. He was only going home anyway. He expected the shop to be warmer, to feel a cushion of warm air as he stepped in from the cold of the street. But it was neutral. It wasn't cold. But it wasn't warm. It wasn't anything. And exactly in line with what he thought from outside, it was very old-fashioned. Isaac figured they must be going for a period look. There were no electric guitars, just pianos, woodwind, saxophone, some drum kits, violins and a double bass. As he looked around, he thought they were a jazz specialist. There were piles of old sheet music and some antique-looking gramophone records. They must be worth a bob or two. So, what took your fancy, the salesman said. They were the only two in the shop. No surprise at closing time, of course. Isaac indicated the gleaming saxophone in the window. Ah, that! You have good taste, my friend. There was something about the blog that seemed familiar. The way he talked. His body language and his hand gestures, but even after furrowing his brow while he tried to recollect who the man reminded him of, and failing, he took the saxophone from the salesman's hand. I can't afford it, he said. The salesman laughed. No, it is a choice item, but if you love the sax, then you need to try it. Try it? Sure, give it a go. Isaac hesitated. He felt the cold weight of the saxophone in his hand. It was a beautiful thing. The man waited. Isaac felt almost shy. Then, with a shrug, he put it to his lips. He played the saxophone piece from April in Paris by Charlie Parker. He played it well. The sax flowed like honey and molten light. It was smooth, it was sweet, and the notes sailed and tripped around the music shop. The salesman stood grinning, and when Isaac had finished, he broke out into a round of spontaneous applause. Well, son, he said, you have a rare talent, and that sax suits you. Isaac liked performing, and he liked when people liked his performance. He didn't know why he'd played a famous jazz piece. Maybe it was the shop theme and surroundings. He wanted to play something more modern. He played the sax from Children of the Sun. The salesman gave a polite clap when he'd finished. Don't know that one, he said, but you played it well. It's a lovely instrument, Isaac said, making to hand it back. The salesman didn't take it, though. Honestly, Isaac said, I can't pay for this. The salesman looked thoughtful. Listen, son, we get a lot of people come in here and try out our instruments. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. But you have a phenomenal talent. Isaac blushed. It's the instrument that makes me sound good. Well, that helps. But if you don't have the talent to start off with, you can't fake it. Very kind of you to say so, Isaac said, handing the saxophone back. But still, the salesman declined to take it. How about if I lend it to you? What? Well, you can't afford it now, but playing that sax, your future is bright. I see you being a big success. When you make your money, come back and pay me for it. You can't be serious. I am serious. I respect your talent. I know you have a great future. Consider it an investment. Isaac looked at the saxophone in his hands. It was beautiful. He wanted it. It was like he'd just been given something seriously magical. He was tempted but he really couldn't afford it. Don't give it to me back, I won't take it. Seeing that Isaac still hesitated, the man said, if it makes you feel better, I'll let you pay me double what it says on the ticket. Isaac gulped, the ticket said enough, never mind double, but that somehow made it easier to accept. Okay, I'll pay you double, I promise. By when? The man grinned. I know you'll do well, but let's say maybe a year and a day. A year and a day today? The time period seemed weird, but Isaac said, OK, that's a deal. The man shook his hand. 
There really was something awfully familiar about him. This is really generous of you, Isaac said. The man laughed. Just think of it as me taking an interest in your career. Isaac left the shop with the saxophone in its old-fashioned case. He couldn't believe his luck, but he wouldn't take the mick. He'd pay the guy back, double, like he said, once he'd made his fortune. Two days later, he took the saxophone round to his grandmother's house and played for her in a small front room with its net curtains and old-style sofa and chairs. Oh, you're so talented, she said. It's lovely. Isaac knew prog rock wasn't her thing, so he played When the Saints and John Brown's Body. She kept saying, Play me another, and the neighbours banged on a thin wall that separated the houses. You take after your father, his grandmother said. You've got his talent. He was a musician. Isaac went quiet. They never talked about his dad. His mother had brought him up as a single parent in South London with help from her parents. Because his mother and father never married and he was born illegitimate, it was a scandal. What did he play? Well, I only met him two or three times, but he played the piano. He was a professional. She met him when he was playing one of those dance halls. What happened to him? Isaac asked quietly. He didn't want to push it too hard in case the flow of information dried up and his grandmother said no more. He knew his mother would never talk to him about his dad. He was killed. He was on the M1 heading north to do a concert with his band. They had a crash. Anguish ripped through Isaac. Why does mum never talk about him? His grandmother smiled sadly. Too painful. It broke her heart. She never wanted another. She was a pretty girl. She could have had her choice. But none was the equal of her piano player man. You look just like him though. His mother told him a little about his father. He was called Dave Butler, a Londoner, but she couldn't remember the name of his band. Soon Isaac's thoughts of his father took second place. He went back to the Golden Void and rehearsed and gigged with them relentlessly. He threw everything into his musical career. They got a manager who got them gigs around London, and then they had a brief appearance with Hawkwind and Mann at the Roundhouse, and Isaac got to meet his hippie idol Nick Turner. He jammed with Gong one time, and things went up and up until they were supporting Yes at the Hammersmith Odeon, and then the big break came when they did a few dates back in Genesis for their London shows. They got a record deal with United Artists by the end of the summer, and cut their first album, Masks of Poseidon, at the Lansdowne Studio for United Artists. It got to number 32 in the album charts, which was pretty respectable, and they got a hit single off it, Infinite Staircase, and the money flowed in. Autumn came again, the weather grew more chill, the leaves in Kennington Park turned yellow and gold and fell in heaps across the paths cleared up by uniformed park keepers every morning. It was the anniversary of him getting the saxophone, the anniversary and one day. Isaac headed into central London. He had his prized saxophone in its case and his checkbook. He was going back to the shop on Denmark Street to pay his dues. He had to meet the band's manager first on Wardour Street and he took them all for lunch at the Gay Hazar and Isaac lost track of time. It was getting dark that October night when Isaac began to hurry to Denmark Street. He hoped the shop wouldn't shut early. He hadn't phoned ahead. It even crossed his mind the shop guy might think he would never see Isaac again, and now regretted his hasty generosity. Just like a year previously, it was cold and dark, and the first tendrils of fog gathered as he turned onto Denmark Street. It was like the evening conspired to recreate the conditions of a year and a day ago. He walked quickly down the street, but when he got to where he clearly remembered the shop being, it wasn't there. The shop front was gone and the windows now had blinds on them. The brass sign said it was a musician's agent now. Damn, what if he'd gone out of business in the meantime? Isaac felt sick with guilt. Not that him paying for the sacks would likely have kept the business afloat. He stood back and looked at the windows. There was light on inside. On impulse, he knocked on the door. Then he saw there was a bell, so he pushed that too. A young woman came to the door, holding it ajar. Do you have an appointment? No, I was just wondering how long you've been here. She looked taken aback. Me? What do you mean? No, the company. I don't know, a good few years now. Years? Yes, will that be all? But before he could answer, she shut the door in his face. That didn't make sense. He knew he'd been there exactly a year ago, a year and a day. He looked around. The rest of Denmark Street looked the same as it always had. 
He hadn't specifically been here, he thought, in the past year, but he'd been nearby. He hadn't noticed the sharp classic musical instruments, but he hadn't been looking out for it. The Gioconda was still open. He went for a coffee and placed his saxophone on the table. His checkbook was still in his pocket, ready to pay for it. The man who served him in the cafe wore a white apron. He was fat with curly grey hair and looked like he spent a lot of time smoking. Isaac said, Hey, have you been working here long? Who wants to know, the man said. Just that agency down the road. Which? There's tons. I like rats in a squat. Isaac reeled off the name. Hey, him, he's a tosser. What was there before that? He's been there ages. Before him, there was a sheet music shop. Do you remember there was a shop called Classic Musical Instruments? For the first time, the fat man's face broke into a smile. Yeah, Dave used to run that. He was a top geezer. That was nearly 20 years ago. I was just a kid then. He'd always help me out with a few quid if I was short. He shook his head. He died, you know. How? Car crash. He was in a band. They was on their way to a gig. Tragic it was. Isaac's heart pounded. What did they call him? Dave, like I said. The man thought for a while. Then, with a smile of remembrance, said, Dave. David Butler. That was him. Hello, I hope you enjoyed the story. Now, I want to just take a few seconds, maybe a minute of your time, just to tell you about memberships. So YouTube has allowed the classic ghost stories and me, Tony Walker, to do memberships. And what these are is that you uh, pay um, every month and support the channel. There are perks and it's supposed to be attractive. So there are three levels of memberships. The first is the spooks. For the spooks, you get access to custom emojis designed by my daughter Imogen. You get um, a link to a bundle of MP3s, quite a lot of MP3s of classic ghost stories narrated by me that you can download and listen to at your leisure. You can even tag them all together and there are many hours of them and fall asleep, okay, if that's what you wish. Um, the, the next tier is the ghouls and um, you get the, the benefits of the, the perks, as YouTube call them, of the bottom tiers. You get the emojis, you get the MP3s, but you also get um, video recordings of me reading stories. Now there are nine up already of my Haunting of Dungarvan Castle, which has gone down very well. I will be doing other stories, I will be doing other people's stories, but they will be recorded but of video rather than audio. But the top level is the vampires, and in addition to the perks that we've talked about before, you vampires, you get um, access to a monthly book club discussion with me. And I'm not the expert, I only have ideas, and you have ideas as well, so we can discuss what we think of these stories and uh, so some very interesting ideas come up. So that's briefly memberships. If you can't support the channel through memberships, that is cool. I mean, it's a great thing. It's, it's, it's great that you listen anyway. But of course, with memberships, it allows me to spend more time producing content, which is what I want to do and hopefully what you'd like to see as well. OK, so if you can't support, that's great. If you can, that's really, really great. OK, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.